I'm Anthony Leeds and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this episode of this series of discussions that I have with colleagues who've worked in areas that relate to the management and treatment of people with obesity and obesity related conditions. And today we're going to talk to Dr. Adrian Brown, Senior Research Fellow at University College in London, Senior Research Fellow in Nutrition and Dietetics, who's going to tell us about some work that was done uh, a couple of years ago at uh, Imperial College London uh, on people with type 2 diabetes who were being treated with uh, insulin. Now those therefore were people who had suffered from their condition for rather longer than those who were involved in the studies that we've already described in this uh, series of talks. You'll recall that Professor Mike Lean has described the direct diabetes remission trial and this work that was undertaken by Adrian Brown was in fact an extension to patients with longer standing disease. Adrian, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you very much, Tony, for, in uh, for, for inviting me. Okay, so perhaps we could begin uh, with a description of the type of people who were involved in this trial and why you thought it was important to do this. I suppose, I mean, a comment I would make is that patients who know all about the diabetes direct trial, and there are many of them because it's funded by Diabetes UK, lots of publicity is being given to it, so that everybody knows about it, but there are all those tens, hundreds of thousands of people who already have diabetes in the UK who would then say, well, could this type of weight loss program be of use to me, even though I have a more advanced state of disease? What's the, what was the type of person who was involved in this trial? Yeah, Tony, you make some really good points that a lot of the data up to date is really focused on prevention and remission uh, with the direct study. And so what we were really interested in is we were interested in the group of individuals that had advanced type two diabetes and that were on insulin. And often this type of patient is really complex and often has very limited treatment options available to them. So what we aim to do is we aim to test whether using a low energy formula-based diet, a total diet replacement, very similar to what was used in direct, was effective and safe in people with, uh, with long-standing type 2 diabetes treated with insulin. So the types of people that we were really looking at is we were looking for people living with obesity. So that would mean that their body mass index, so their height to weight, was over 30 kilograms per meter squared. They had type 2 diabetes and they were on insulin. We were specifically looking at adults, so those aged between 18 and 70. And they needed to be treated with insulin, as we said. And particularly for those that had, that had been on insulin for a longer period of time, what we tend to find is the cells that produced insulin, these are called the beta cells in the pancreas, tend to get worn out. So we want to make sure that they had um, a reserve in them. So basically we did a test to make sure that if they started this diet, it was safe. Some exclusion criteria that we really made sure that we that we uh, weren't included in the study was we made sure that we didn't have people with type 1 diabetes. Um, we uh, looked for people with really complex microvascular changes. So these are changes particularly to the eyes, the kidneys or the feet. Um, we avoided people with advanced, more advanced kidney disease as at the present time um, uh, the use of low energy darts is contraindicated or not appropriate for those with a, with, a, with a kidney function of under 30. We were really mindful of mental health and politically psychological health. So we, we tried to avoid people with significant mental health issues and those with psychiatric issues. And in addition to that, we looked to avoid people with current binge eating disorder. And I know a lot of people living with obesity do have binge eating disorder, but it's making sure that that's controlled at the time. Finally, we made sure that people were able to actually be aware about hypoglycemic episodes, because if what you tend to find with people with more advanced diabetes is their awareness of, of hypoglycemia tends to reduce and actually, if people have low blood glucose, which is a potential thing of losing significant amounts of weight and reducing your insulin, we wanted to make sure that they were aware. 
Yeah. So having identified the type of people who would participate in this, mm. uh, what did you what did you then do with them? Yeah. So so we took 90 patients with advanced type 2 diabetes. And what we did is we randomized them. So we basically put them into one group or another. And people were basically equal chance of being in both. And so in the intervention group, the low energy diet group, what we did is we put them onto a total diet replacement of a low energy formula based diet. So these are diets, as I'm sure you've heard in the other programs, are diets based on and using uh, shakes, soups and bars. So we put them on that for a period of 12 weeks. That was generally around four product a day. Calories range between around 808 and 824 calories. After 12 weeks, we would then start to introduce food um, gradually to start off with. So what we do is we took off one product and would introduce one meal um, that took them up to around a thousand calories. Then after six weeks on that, we increased it up to two, uh, 1,200. So we took off another product. So they're on two products and two meals up to six months or 24 weeks. And then we return them back onto their normal diet, um, a sort of a healthy, balanced diet. But we adjusted carbohydrate to manage their blood glucose. Yeah. The control group that weren't in this intervention were basically given energy restricted advice based on um, their uh, calculating their total energy expenditure. So how many calories they burn every day, taking off 600 calories and then giving them the same dietary advice as the intervention group had at six at six months. In addition to that, both groups got behavior change advice. So we talked about goal setting, emotional eating, slip up setbacks, and also we talked about physical activity and making sure they were physically active through this period of time as well. One of the things we should add uh, for the benefit who, of anybody who missed the previous programs is that the diet that you use, the formula diet you used, is designed to provide all micronutrients, mm. uh, adequate protein and so on, and yet be energy restricted. Because when you have an intake of only 820 or 840 calories per day from conventional food, it becomes a little bit difficult to achieve uh, adequate micronutrient intake, doesn't it? Yeah, very much so. And so these products actually at times probably gave people better nutritional quality than they actually had before they started the diet because it met all those recommended intakes. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is interesting because the amount of experimental evidence showing that you improve the nutritional status, of course, is very limited. You probably know that in Copenhagen, mm -hmm. in our older people with osteoarthritis, we did actually measure vitamin D status yeah. and also uh, vitamin B12. So mm -hmm. these are older individuals. And we found that about 50% of them were in a marginal status with vitamin D at the beginning. And at the end, that had gone down to about 5 or 6%. So there was a, and we know from the measurements made, that they improved their vitamin D and B12 uh, levels in blood and so on. Um, so we know that where we've looked at it, there are good outcomes. More work needs to be done in that area. A very important area, actually, particularly with sp some specific micronutrients when you're thinking about um, diabetes. Um, Okay, so what were your findings uh, after the initial weight loss and then subsequently at the end of the maintenance period? Yeah, very much so. So individuals on the total diet replacement basically lost significantly greater weight loss. So they lost around 9.8 kilos compared to 5.6 kilos in the control group. Now, the difference is, is around f just over four kilos, but... The reason that people did so well on the control group is that we threw the kitchen sink at them. And actually, if they went into typical diabetes care, the level of support and behavior change that they received over the 12 months wouldn't be possible. So actually, the, the effect of this program was potentially reduced by the fact that we actually really made sure that the only difference between... Yeah these two interventions was the diet. So what we noticed is insulin doses significantly reduced. We noticed that in the intervention group, there was a 75% reduction in insulin doses. But in addition to that, what we saw is that people stopped insulin. 
People have been on these medications up to some of them over 10 years and actually cease. So what we found is nearly 40 percent, so 39.4 percent of individuals on the intervention stopped insulin compared to 5.6 percent in the people that weren't. We also saw a significant improvement in quality of life. Um, in fact, we used the same measurement as the direct study, and actually we saw some slightly greater improvements in the, in the visual analog scale, so the EQ5D, which was the questionnaire that was used, compared to direct, and that might represent people's actually being on insulin as well. Mm. Now, we also, this is unpublished data, it's six month data, we also saw some improvements in sleep as well. So when we assess, assess sleepiness through using the Epworth sleep scale and also um, quality of sleep using the Pittsburgh sleep quality index, we saw significant reductions at six months in, in, uh, in improvements in sleepiness and also sleep quality compared mm -hmm. to control. Now, did we so see- if I can interrupt you there, yeah, that's sorry. interesting because as you know, uh, studies in Copenhagen uh, yeah. and elsewhere provide a limited amount of evidence mm -hmm. that this kind of intervention does improve uh, sleep, mm -hmm. it improves quality. So your your evidence, uh, which I would encourage you to try, try and publish yeah. as soon as you can because it's important, uh, is very, very useful. And in clinical practice, you and I have both seen individuals who, where mm -hmm. they've lost 10 to 15 kilograms in weight, report feeling that their sleep is so much better. Yes. And of course, if they have a sleep, specific sleep disorder like obstructive sleep apnea, then we have the experimental evidence that that improves as well. So sleep is a target, isn't it, for this type of weight reduction? Very much so. We see a significant number of individuals coming to our clinics with obstructive sleep apnea and being diagnosed within our clinics. So, and we, we are aware, as you're quite rightly saying, that, that, that weight loss is one of the key treatments <laughs> for obstructive sleep apnea, uh, uh, apart from actually um, have, have, having CPAP, uh, all, the, all these mechanical uh, devices to keep your breathing stable at night. And so I think weight loss is incredibly important in, in, in this process. Now, we did also look at lipids um, and we looked at blood pressure. Um, um, and what we noticed that there tended to be an improvement at six months, but at 12 months, we didn't notice a difference. Now, there's a variety of different reasons that we could look at this, but one of the reasons that we feel that lipids or the fat in blood didn't change is that the patients remained on statins. So they remained on the medication that actually reduced down their, their, their uh, lipids or their fat in their blood because people with more advanced type 2 diabetes are at greater risk of cardiovascular disease. And so compared to people with more earlier disease, we felt that it was, for a safety point of view, it was more appropriate to keep them on these statins. Um, so we're unclear exactly if there could be really great benefits in reductions of, 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 of uh, fats within the blood. But at the present time, we're, we're unclear with that answer. And with regard to blood pressure, presumably, what did you see with blood pressure? Not very much change? Yeah, we, we again, and many of yes. them remained on the blood pressure medication, again, due to risk. Some mm. of them actually stopped the blood pressure medication and also saw some significant results. But when we brought it all together, the six month outcomes, we saw the reductions, but actually at 12 months, um, uh, we, we didn't see those, those being maintained. One of the things with this programme, and this sort of goes down to the importance of continued support, was we wanted to see what would happen after the six month period if they returned to normal treatment, which would be see people at three months and at 12 months. And unfortunately, what you see is you see a gradual weight regain from the lowest point of around 16, about uh, 15 kilos. So even after weight regain, these individuals had lost 10% of their body weight. If we'd, uh, if we'd used potentially other ways to help maintain that, keep more regular contact, use continued um, use of the products, as you'll know, the data out of Copenhagen clearly shows that either using, having periods of time where people go through a total diet replacement for around four weeks or continue to use one or two products a day 
they can maintain 10 kilos of weight loss up to four years. So mm -hmm. I think if we can help people in that period of time, I think we would see the results that we saw at six months move on to potentially 12. Yeah. I think also the other thing in your uh, results was that your control group on the normal diet, as you say, got a lot of intervention. And yeah. you, in clinical practice, if you had patients who performed like that or, or managed to do that, you'd be yeah. extraordinarily pleased because they had great results. So yeah. your control group had great results. Therefore, you didn't show as much difference as you'd expect. Yeah. Nevertheless, the results are very important because one yeah. of the key things that um, viewers and listeners will know is that people with diabetes are at risk of various complications and we know that reducing weight actually reduces the various variables that drive those processes and therefore it's just as important for people who are insulin treated to be at an optimal weight yes. uh, as it is for those who are not yet taking insulin. And of course people are very highly motivated aren't they? If they're, When you first talk to them about having to start insulin uh, they would do anything they possibly could to delay that, if possible. Mm. So that might be one point at which to catch people at a point where they're very highly, moti very highly motivated to put them through this type of um, program. Very much so. I, I, that's a really, really good point related to when is it best to potentially catch the catch these in, in individuals. And I think what's important is we do catch them before they go on to insulin what we know from the data particularly in the uk is there tends to be a delay on people initiating insulin until people have really poor control so the data from primary care is that hba1c is on average around 9.85 nearly 10 percent before insulin is initiated and i think before it's initiated that is a perfect point but what we really need to do is we need to focus on controlling blood glucose earlier on in the journey and actually getting people to lose weight earlier rather than later once blood glucose and uh, the control reduces down so what you're hinting at there is that actually in diabetes management generally perhaps we are not as good at helping people to lose weight as we are as we should be I, I, I think traditionally what we've done is we've over focused on controlling blood glucose at the expense of actually addressing the underlying cause and often the underlying what some of the underlying causes with type 2 diabetes is obesity and inflammation but this excess adiposity can actually impact on blood glucose and that can be a key factor so what we tend to do is if you can imagine a leaking roof so instead of actually fixing the leaking roof what we do is we put buckets underneath the leaks yeah. in the hope that they won't stop and once one bucket overflows which could be a medication we simply add another bucket to cope with that excess glucose and so what we really need to be doing is putting in treatments that actually manage the underlying issues as opposed to addressing uh, and putting plasters over something that should really be fixed. Yeah. So my next question is, what, what are the barriers to the introduction of this type of treatment? So we're, we're specifically talking now about people who've had their diabetes for some time who are mm. treated with insulin. Yeah. I know that you and I both know that this has got to go through several stages before yeah. it can be translated into yeah. practice and it's going to take quite a while, uh, qu quite a number of years. Uh, mm. The next step presumably is uh, is, is large multi-centre trials and, and so on. Would that be the next step? I, I, I think there's a, f that there's a few steps here, Tony. I completely agree that we need to have some more evidence and I'm very privileged to currently be about to start a trial looking at um, patients living uh, with obesity on type 2 diabetes on insulin and looking to use this program with a digital app and we're really hoping that those results when they come out will really drive forward that actually we can manage this group within the within uh, the the health service and actually we can benefit people I think some of the barriers are related to commissions of the program. Um, and I think understandably the priorities have focused on prevention and remission within this group. And it's come at the expense of actually a group of individuals 
that are highly complex and actually probably cost more to manage than people before um, uh, uh, those that potentially could achieve remission because they're on insulin, they're on multiple medications, they have complex complications. And so I think we really need to be changing the narrative. We need to be identifying these issues and saying we do have effect, potentially effective treatments to help these individuals and informing the people that actually commission these services that it is possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, you're, you're, of course, talking in the UK context and our yeah. audience is a, is a global context where uh, uh, processes of healthcare delivery are different, sometimes yeah. by insurance funded uh, sources sometimes by state provision, sometimes by private provision, so all of, all of these different options yeah. out there. So we need to give a little bit of guidance uh, and a caution to, to people in terms of this yeah. type of intervention for this. Um, what, what are the key things that you would say to all of the people who are listening about thinking about losing weight if they are a person who's had their diabetes for say 12 or 14 years and then is insulin treated? What are, what advice would you give mm, I, I, yeah i think i think one of the most important things here is to actually seek support for these uh for, uh, if you're going to plan to do anything so go and speak to your primary care physician um or your diabetes team or if you have an obesity uh physician that you access them speak to them about what is possible locally see if you can get referral to a dietitian they're absolutely key within this process um, obviously, psychological support can help as well. But I think one of those key factors is making sure that whatever you do, you get that support. They'll be able to help, particularly for people with advanced type 2. There needs to be management of the medication. Mm -hmm. There needs to be ad adequate support to make sure that uh, insulin is reduced, to make sure you don't get excessive hypos. Um, other medications are adjusted accordingly. If you if your blood pressure improves, your blood pressure medication might need to be reduced to avoid sort of these these dizzy spells. And so, I very much feel the first step, if you really want to start to get some improvement, is go and seek some support. Okay, so, and, and as viewers are aware, uh, in association with the image of the interview, underneath it is text, including some web links to all the various sources of information that are relevant um, to this uh, situation. So that is that will be provided. Um, I wonder if there's any, uh, I'm going to ask you my standard question now, which is, <laughs> you know, if I provide you with huge resources, I know you're doing a study already, yeah. but if it was possible to gain huge resources, bearing in mind our South Asian audience, mm -hmm. what would you like to see happen in relation to this type of, of individual? Yeah, I mean, adequate resources, adequate resources. I'd love to do some multi center studies in South Asia without a shadow of a doubt. I think they're absolutely key. I think the areas um, uh, in particular, we know they have higher incidence of, of diabetes. And so particularly getting more translatable data across within the populations would be absolutely key. I think there needs to be comprehensive treatment options for all people across the spectrum of, the, of type 2 diabetes. So that goes from prevention programs to remission programs to actually managing and helping support people with more advanced type 2 diabetes. I think you mentioned before about the challenges related to some of the healthcare systems related to insurance and there needs to be equitable care, not equ not not act, just simply access for those that can't that can't necessarily afford treatment uh, or potentially live in the right area to be able to access it and i think we we need to be mindful that particularly those that are from ethnic minority groups and potentially um, are at greater risk, as I said, and we really need to be focusing on those vulnerable uh, people. So ultimately, I'll be, I would like to do some multi-center studies, but mm -hmm. I think then within the infrastructure locally, there needs to be adequate provision to offer equitable care to all. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Adrian Brown at University College in London, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.